O Heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fill us all things. Treasure of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity. Save our souls of the Lord. So what are the questions, are there? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, towards uh, the second half of the liturgy, there's a phrase that says, Твоя от твоих тебе приносящий от всех и за вся. What does that mean? Твоя от твоих тебе. Thine own of thine own. Right. We offer unto thee. Yeah, on behalf of all and for all. Well, once when we get there, uh -huh. I'll explain it more fully. But the whole point is, we're offering to God that which is already His. As, a, as an offering on behalf of, actually, for everyone and everything. Um, uh, um, and so that's, um, that's really like the, the core of it. Right there. <coughs> what else? But that that um, that really will be in the um, uh, um, when we talk about the anaphora. We've got a ways to go. So let me get. What is the uh, anaphora? The anaphora. Uh, that is the. Uh, what would you call it? It's the it's the uh, the prayer of offering that starts with uh, 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 lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. And then the long prayer of the consecration. Let me get this. Uh... Oh, Okay, we got to the point where we were talking about <clears throat> the ascent, the, we got to the point of the Trisadian. Um, holy, 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 Lord God, of, well, uh, the first Trisadian. <coughs> and there are two Trisadians in the liturgy. There's, there's the, the, the Trisadian in the anaphora. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth is full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. But there's a previous Trisadian. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. <clears throat> now that uh, uh, that comes after <coughs> after the entrance, and the. Uh, So there's a, a sequence. Come, let us worship. And so the, the bishop has gone in. Um, on one hand, the, uh, what the bishop is doing is the sensing um, of the altar. Uh, the choir is singing. This um, and then the choir is 
Um, So the true part in Kentucky. So we talked about that, right? Okay. So after, so the bishop, the choir. Um, Other clergy. Really, the, if you really look at the celebration of the liturgy, especially when there's a bishop serving, a hierarchical liturgy, it's mostly the bishop and the deacon with the choir. The priests kind of just stand there, um, and the and the bishop deigns to give them a a line here and there. And there are twelve times during the liturgy when when that can happen. So after the bishop uh, finishes the, the sensing uh, and, the, and the choir, um, there's the uh, So during the um, the prayer the prayer of the Trisagion, the choir is still singing for the most part the Trifari and Kentakian, um, and then uh, for Holy Art Thou. Which is what? Then the, the bishop's line is for or the main, the celebrating priest for Holy Art Thou. Uh, initiates the singing of the Trisagion, Holy God. Why? Sethi Bolje. Um, did we talk about the structure? Yeah, we talked about the structure a little bit of the Trisagion. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think we've read the prayer. I looked at the prayer. <clears throat> this is so the prayer of the entrance, um, which we did talk about. Uh, if you remember, is O Master, Lord our God, who is appointed in heaven, orders and hosts of angels and archangels for the service of Thy glory. Grant that with our entrance there may be an entrance of holy angels, serving with us and glorifying thy goodness. For unto thee do all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. <coughs> um, that prayer is usually being said silently while the, while the servers are all lining up. The bishop is still in the middle. He's, and then um, before the singing of uh, come let us worship. Um, but the whole point is that we're entering into the angelic liturgy. That our liturgy is already a participation in the angelic liturgy. Grant that with our, en with our entrance there may be an entrance of all <coughs> holy angels serving with us and glorifying thy goodness. <coughs> Only in this part of the liturgy this whole angelic participation, we're, where are we? We're still on earth. We're still just gathered as the temp, gathered in the temple. But, but the temple becomes filled with the angels who serve with us to glorify God. And, and so with that comes the singing, uh, and that's the introduction to the singing of uh, the Trisagion, Holy Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. <clears throat> now, there's other places um, in the scriptures which quote, uh, which are quotations, um, or rather, 
There are places in the scriptures which are used as quotations um, for the Trisagion of the Anaphora. Holy, 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 Lord of Savo, of heaven and earth, of all thy glory. There's the beginning of Isaiah, there's the beginning of, and, and there's uh, in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> which, are revel which, are, which reveal um, the, uh, the liturgy of heaven. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a vision and an image of the liturgy of heaven which, uh, to which uh, the prophet, whether Isaiah or John, has ascended um, to, part, uh, to participate. Um, let's look at uh, Isaiah 6. <coughs> And this is um, chapter 6, we'll start with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. Two, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now, do you recognize that? Mm -hmm. yes. it's from the liturgy of St. Basil. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, say to this people, Hear and hear, but do not understand. Go and see and do not perceive, and so forth. <clears throat> So the, the real content uh, or the, uh, of, of this heavenly liturgy is, is, the sing, is the constant eternal singing of this hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, or Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Um, and it's a, which it's a hymn of praise. Um, <coughs> I must be allergic to something in here. Now, and then there's a parallel text. Revelations chapter 4. And Revelations chapter 4 is the, probably one of the most important uh, sources for an, an image of the liturgy of the time of the New Testament. Um, uh, on one hand, it's a, it uses a vision of the, of the liturgy of, uh, of the church at the time. On the other hand, uh, it's a vision of the fulfillment of, of that uh, reality in heaven, of its, of its heavenly source. So, uh, Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and lo, in heaven an open door, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up hither, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he said, And he who sat there appeared like jasper and carnelian, and round about the throne was a rainbow and that looked like an emerald. Round the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four priests, who were his presbyters, <clears throat> clad in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads. From the throne issued flashes of lightning and voices and peals of thunder. And before the throne burned seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there is, as it were, a sea of glass. And round the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, 
the third living creature with the face of a man, <clears throat> the fourth living creature like a flying eagle, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes round about with and within, and day and night they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whatever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, singing, Worthy uh, art thou, o our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things. And by thy will they, were, they existed and were created. <coughs> Now, can you see the parallel between the Isaiah vision and, and this vision of Christ, of Jesus? Um, yes. And, and, and so the, the whole ethos of, of our worship is that our worship is participation in that heavenly worship. It's an icon, it's an image, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a form and a likeness. Um, and that's why we worship like we do, um, because that's what orthodoxy means. It's 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 a it's a it's a true image of the of the heavenly worship. Now, the Trisag the, the this first Trisagion of the liturgy <clears throat> is a little different than uh, than the one that will be used later on. <clears throat> Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. And I believe the story goes that sometime um, in the 5th century there was um, a child who uh, had a vision. I think the child was dying, or I don't remember exactly. Um, and the angel appeared. Um, uh, or the child was, was, was humming or singing a hymn to God, and the angel appeared. And he said, at home we do it like this. Agios of Theos, Agios Iskiros, Agios of Thanatos, Eles Hanimos. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Um, and this was, and then, and so this was, this became a very kind of well-known vision. It was turned into a hymn and adopted by the church. Um, and although I'm sure there was some kind of predecessor to that in the liturgy, um, uh, I don't know what it is. Um, but what's, what's clear is that there's this double ascent in the liturgy. And remember, the first part of the liturgy is the liturgy of the Word. Um, the ascent to the rational comprehension of God as He has revealed Himself. Um, and, and this is important because, what, because it's the Word expressing God in a way that we can understand Him um, as far as possible. And the second part of the liturgy is the ascent to communion with God, which is ultimately beyond words. And so there's this double ascent, and you have to, go, get, go, you have to get to the one in order to get to the other. Otherwise, you can't jump very well, <clears throat> from, you know, from, from the earth into heaven. You kind of need a step. And so, so the, the word of God, the, the preaching of the gospel, the, the teaching uh, is a step, but, it, but, all, but all of that is still within this context of the angelic worship um, and, a, uh, and an image of that angelic worship in heaven. And so, uh, having entered uh, the altar with with the angels, um, we then uh, the bishop then says this prayer. <clears throat> o holy God, who dost rest in the saints, who art hymned by the seraphim with the thrice holy cry, and glorified by the cherubim, and worshipped by every heavenly power, who out of nothing has brought all things into being who has created man after thine own image and likeness, and adorned him with thine every gift, who givest to him who asks wisdom and understanding, who does not despise the sinner, 
but instead is appointed repentance unto salvation, who is vouchsafed unto us thy humble and unworthy servants, even in this hour to stand before the glory of thy holy altar, and to offer worship and praise which are due unto thee. Thyself, O Master, accept even from the mouths of us sinners the thrice holy hymn, and visit us in thy goodness. Forgive us every transgression, both voluntary and involuntary. Sanctify our souls and bodies, and enable us to serve thee in holiness all the days of our life. The intercessions of the Holy Theotokos and of all the saints from the beginning of the world have been well-pleasing to thee. And then comes the ekphenesis, which is, is what you hear, because this prayer is usually said quietly. <clears throat> For holy art thou, O our God, and unto thee do we send up glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things to point out. You know, the first part of the prayer is obviously referring both to the Isaiah vision and to the book and the vision of, of the book of Revelation, right? Him by the seraphim with the thrice holy cry and glorified by the cherubim and worshipped by every, every heavenly power. <clears throat> this, is, this is also very important because it, this constitutes uh, uh, a rejection <clears throat> of the of the Jewish worldview, which um, for the for the rabbinic tradition, um, they rejected the existence of the angels. Very important, very important thing, and so for example, um, and it, it talks about that in the uh, in the New Testament. Remember where um, the Sadducees were set up set against the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead and angels and souls and all of these things. But the Sadducees rejected the resurrection of the dead. They rejected the idea of an afterlife. In other words, when you're dead, you're dead. They rejected the idea of the soul. They rejected the, um, the idea of the heavenly powers. Um, but they had it in the temple, right? The but it was, in the, it was in the early temple. And they had it. And right. They don't. And, then, and then they got rid of it. So this Sadducee tradition um, got taken into Rabbinic Judaism. But I thought that that stopped um, in, in 70 A.D. With the, with the killing of the temple, and the Maccabeans just said, no, there's no more Sadducees. Well, not, the Maccabeans were long, that was 150 B.C. Okay, wrong words, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is typical of me. But at, at that point, according to the history that I read, the Sadducees died out. Well, they died, but their ideas got integrated. The, people, the Sadducees as a sect died out, but the people were integrated into the Judaism that survived um, after the destruction of the temple and was reconstituted when people came together from all parts of the diaspora. Which is just the rabbinic reading of the laws. Which is the rabbinic... Um, and the Sadducees were part of that. Yeah. And so there, there are very strong strains within contemporary Judaism that believe that. Still. That still believe that. They reject. And I think that's, that's probably the root of this kind of, sec, of, the, of the secular, I mean, the very secular part of Judaism. Uh, because there's all, there are also Jews who believe in the resurrection of the dead and the <clears throat> angels and all this other stuff. Um, you know, an example of that, remember when the, uh, uh, the rabbi from New York died? Um, what was his name, Schneerson or something? Um, anyway, there was this, this um, super Orthodox rabbi in, in, uh, in New York, and his disciples all held vigil at his tomb because they expected him to rise from the dead after three days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they, in fact, they also um, built an exact replica down to the wallpaper and the dishes of his house from Brooklyn in the Judean desert. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, in the seventies. No, no, no. This is like the seventies or eighties. I think in the eighties. Well, it was there when I was there, and that was in the eighties. Yeah. So it was late seventies, probably. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, so I mean, so you've got. I mean, Judaism is a very complex phenomenon. Very complex. You know, it's it's as complex as Christianity is, um, relative to its size. Um, 
so, but one of the things that, that um, that's interesting that um, when the uh, current text of Genesis was being edited, one of the things that was in the in the Masoretic tradition, one of the things that was edited out very heavily were the mentions of the angels and of the heavenly host. Um, and so then they didn't get put into the Protestant Bibles? Right. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But it's in the Orthodox Bible? It's in the Orthodox Bible. Mm -hmm. Because it's the Septuagint, it's a much earlier uh, text. That's the, Greek. That's yeah. the Greeks. Right. Yeah. Which, which text would have the angels in it? Uh, just well, that. Septuagint and, and other pre-Christian. And that, that would be parts of Genesis we're talking about? Mm -hmm. The creation narrative, oh. <clears throat> for example. And there are other references, too, that were edited out. Um, you have to remember, the, the, or, the, we, the way we understand, we're not fundamentalists as Orthodox. We do not, um, you know, say it's, this, is, this is dropped from God by, you know, by an angel. If you want that, go be a Muslim. You know, well, that's the Quran. You know, they believe it was dropped from God by an angel, um, or a Book of Mormon, or something like that. Um, but that's not the, the Christian understanding, and it's certainly not the Orthodox understanding of, uh, of the scriptures, which have a history. And the text has a history to it. And, and, it's, and there's nothing wrong with understanding that, and, and analyzing it, and <clears throat> looking to see you know, what are the various ways that the text was shaped and how it came down to us, and which texts are more, which versions are more useful to us than others. <clears throat> but just because, um, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons that we have the texts that we do, for example, <clears throat> let's get away from the scriptural text for a second. Just look at the, the standard version of the liturgy. Now, the liturgy has only been standard um, in the Orthodox world since the 16th century, 15th century. Why? The printing press. Why that version? That's the one that got to the printing press first. <laughs> and you think about it, it took a lot of work, an incredible amount of work, to set up a book for printing back in the 16th, 15th century, right? It was an incredible amount of work, you know. Um, they I, they just you know created movable type. Could you imagine? Could you imagine setting thousands of pages by hand, uh, where you had to put in each letter and and piece of punctuation individually? So, one version. That's another another reason for that is why the. Um, why we all have the uh, Tipikon of St. Sabas Monastery. Um, bef in Russia, before the, tip before the printing press, they all used the Tipikon of the Stud Studite Monastery. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing gets replaced. Why? Because the Studite Monastery, Tipikon, had been copied by hand, and hand down is through copyists. But here you had all of these relatively cheap, <clears throat> editions that were mass produced. Um, so it became standard because it was available. Um, I don't even know if there was any kind of synodal decision about that. I rather doubt it. Especially since the, the, at the, that time in the uh, 16th century, um, the Orthodox world was a mess. The the, uh, the Turks had taken Constantinople um, and all of the Balkans. Um, Russia was the only free Orthodox country. Um, the entire Greek-speaking world and, and most of the Slavic-speaking world except for Russia <clears throat> were under Muslim domination, uh, who were not too kind to Christians. One can say that uh, with the... Uh, you know, in other words, they were chopping people's heads off if they wouldn't convert, things like, sounds like today. Um, 
And so, uh, when all of this stuff, and, and incidentally, those printing presses were in Venice and Rome. <laughs> and, all of, and all of the, so the history of, of the Orthodox liturgy actually is um, heavily influenced by Venice and Rome. Um, and actually, and during the Soviet period, of course, no religious books were printed in Russia. And so where did all of the liturgical books come from? Rome. For the Byzantine Rite. So, very interesting. The, there's a bookstore here in Washington that just closed called the Icon and Book Center. Um, that used to be the bookstore of the Russian Center at Fordham University, um, and uh, uh, which had a huge... I mean, a huge assortment of books from the 70s. I mean, it was all actually hard to get a lot of these books, you know, because it was the height of, the, of Soviet power. <clears throat> and, um, and, and so, for example, when, um, when Russian delegations would come um, to the UN or to, you know, for some church meeting, um, they would go to the Icon and Book Center, which was run by Jesuits, by the way, uh, and they would buy out their entire stock of liturgical books to take them back to Russia because you couldn't, you know, there was no way to get liturgical books. You couldn't buy a Bible, you couldn't buy a liturgy book, you couldn't buy also, you know, anything. So, um, <clears throat> it's important to know that there's always been a, shall we say, symbiotic relationship with the Roman Church and the Orthodox Church. Um, even when they're fighting. These were Catholic printing presses? Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. In Rome. In Rome. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. Venice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you think maybe there might have been some insertions of words or no. insertions or anything? No, they didn't. They didn't mess with it? No, they, um, they, at that time they were using a kind of photographic process where they would just photograph the, um, and it would print the photograph. They didn't, they didn't have to retype the entire thing. Some of the books they did, and so they did, in some of the books, you'll, you'll see a commemoration of the Pope inserted. Of course, um, that's what magic markers are for. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that aside. <clears throat> so there's a history to the liturgy, just like there's a history to the scriptures. Um, of course, in Orthodox understanding, um, getting back to the uh, the angels, this is it's the the angelic host is a, it plays an absolutely critical role um, in our whole entire understanding of what creation is, of what of who God is, of, of what He created, of who we are, because theologically. The understanding of, of the human being is that uh, the human, human being is created in the image and likeness of God, as it cites in the prayer, making us higher than the angels. Higher than the angels. Because the angels are purely noetic beings, in other words, pure spirit. Um, but human beings are both material and noetic. And so we combine something within our um, ex within our nature that is that is unique in creation, um, and thus that is what allows the human being uh, to be a, the priest of creation and to offer thine own of thine own, <clears throat> whereas the angels can't offer. The material creation we can because it's what we are, <clears throat> and and, um, and that which we offer is the, the fruit of our labors. Well, at this point, what are we doing? Um, we've entered into into this uh, uh, profound act of worship of singing with the singing the thrice holy hymn uh, to God with the, with the angelic hosts. 
Um, which is why it really annoys me sometimes that when they just rip through the Trisagion, <laughs> you know, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Lord, have mercy on us, Holy... I, this, is, this is one of the most profound acts of worship of the entire liturgy. Um, and, uh, so, and so this is, this is where the music has a lot to do with it. You know, because the music conveys what the, the importance of the, of the hymnography means. Um, and, and, and it not only conveys the meaning, but it allows us to, uh, to uh, in an elevated way, enter into that um, higher level of uh, spiritual worship, um, joining with the angels in, in this uh, uh, worship of the kingdom of heaven. Um, the worship of God in the kingdom. <clears throat> so it's, a, it's an awesome thing to be able to sing, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Because we're singing it with all the angelic hosts. We're echoing heaven. Um, and, uh, and that's the core hymn of worship of heaven. Um, so... Another um, aspect, um, there's a phrase in, the, in this prayer, who give us to him who asks wisdom and understanding. <clears throat> now, in the later prayers of the liturgy, they don't talk about wisdom and understanding. There is a phrase there, um, which is, uh, variously translated, um, but the sorry, I'm going to write it in Greek. Logiki latria. Or is it the other way? Yeah. Yeah. Too many languages. It's not logiki. Sounds like logical, right? And that's essentially what it means. It means rational. But, um, in Latria, is worship. Now, there are two kinds of, of worship, two words for worship. Uh, and when we say, come let us worship, it's, the word is proskinisomen. Defte proskinisomen. That means to bow down. And, and so, remember in, in iconography, in dealing with icons, there are two categories of what worship and veneration mean. How, how, what do we do, what kind of worship do we pay to an icon? Veneration. Veneration. What's the Greek word? Proskinisomen. Proskinisomen. Or proskin, uh, Some variation. Proskinesis. Yes. Proskinesis. <laughs> what is Latria? Adoration. Adoration. Adoration is given only to God noetically. There is nothing that we have latria for, except God himself. Now, uh, isn't that word also mm -hmm. uh, used in uh, like idol service? Uh, uh -huh. Idolatry it yeah. also derives from idolatry. Idolatria. Mm -hmm. Idolatria. The adoration of idols. But we, um, 
we say idolatria is idolatry and it's and it's wrong. It's a sin. Um, and so when we when we have an image, we bow down before it, which is a kind of worship, but we don't adore it. This is this is the this is this is one of the th reasons why the Orthodox have difficulties with the um, uh, Catholic practice called the, vener the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. The idea is okay. The, the, the basic idea is right, <laughs> but they're using the wrong wrong term. The basic idea is that you you venerate you you. Um, the presence, you, you're focusing, you're meditating on the presence of God, which is then, which is kind of focused in, in the Eucharist. And, you know, the Orthodox understanding is, well, the bread of the Eucharist is there to eat, not to, not to look at. You know, we eat it, we don't hold it up and all this other stuff. Well, the, the West had a different idea, and what and and we certainly venerate the sacrament, proskinesis. We bow down before it, right? You know, think about the uh, uh, liturgy of the presanctified. You know, everybody uh, hits the floor when the uh, when, when the gifts are brought out, proskinesis. But latria is something entirely different. So, um, in some places, this is then translated rational, rational worship. But there's another, there's, there's, um, there's another way of translating it, which I think is more important, and this is this is later in the liturgy. Remember when it says in the liturgy, uh, remembering this saving commandment, and all those things which have come to pass for us. Well, that's actually not a good translation. It should be remembering this commandment of the Savior. Um, there's a, a Greek idiom which turns uh, a, a noun into an adjective. So, um, uh, the Savior's commandment be becomes the saving commandment. Rational worship, or the worship of the Logos. Well, that's what I was going to ask, if it's yeah. a part of Logos. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I think, and this is, this is really important, because the whole point of the liturgy, and as, especially as we get into the anaphora, is that it's not our worship. It's Christ's worship of the Father. <laughs> we enter into Christ, Jesus worshiping the Father as the high priest. And we in him by the Holy Spirit. Wow, that's pretty profound. It's very profound. Could you say that again, please? please just... It's all there. Logos <laughs> key is <laughs> is a logos Christ. Right. And um, latreia is the worship. Mm -hmm. This is the worship of Christ. Christ's worship. Yeah. Only they express it in an adjectival formula, mm -hmm. logiki latreia, instead of uh, latreia to logo. And what exactly Which is the communion or the whole liturgy? The whole liturgy, the whole liturgy is is the worship of the Father. Led by the Christ as the high priest. This is this wow. one of the first okay. prayers, mm. right after the Trisagion. Yeah. So, That's amazing. it's an awesome thing that we're involved in. It's an awesome thing, um, and as we, um, you know, and the deeper we go into the liturgy, the more we're entering into the mystical depths. And, and this is, I mean, you can't get much, much more mystical <laughs> to enter into the, into, the, into the height of the mystery than, than Christ's own worship of the Father. 
Now, so I'm sorry. When does that start exactly? That in the liturgy, the Lovely. Well, ultimately, the whole thing is. But 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 it's an Eucharistic canon. Where did you say that? It's in the Eucharistic canon. He's using three languages here. So for the test. So, <clears throat> but you know, to really get to really get into the text, I mean, you've got to know Greek. It really helps. Not that not that the other languages don't take you there, but to understand the original meaning of the text, you've got to know the original text. Um, so we go. go now, the Logiki Latria, that's in the Eucharistic canon. We're not there yet. We're still worship we're still in our own in our own heads. But and we're doing the Trisagnia? Well yeah, but we're but have entered into the we're beginning to enter into the into the angelic worship. We're beginning to ascend. Okay. Um, and so we have the second um, or this other form of Trisagion, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Because the ultimate Logiki Latria is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord of hosts, heaven and earth, and full of thy glory. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's an actual quote from Isaiah. That, yeah. Okay. And Revelation. So, um, now, during the Trisagion, um, I think we discussed it a little bit that, uh, last week, that um, whereas in the priestly form of the liturgy, the choir sings it three times, plus glory now and ever, uh, holy immortal, have mercy on us, then repeats, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. In the hierarchical form, it's sung seven times, um, and the uh, uh, and alternating in the Russian style. There's, there's two styles. There's the Russian style and the Byzantine style. Um, but basically, it's alternating between the clergy and the choir. And then there's this uh, point uh, at the uh, fourth repetition of the Trisagion where the bishop comes out with the candles and he says, Lord, Lord, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vineyard which you have planted with your right hand and establish it. Um, it's probably a good thing that we don't uh, finish the psalm um, because it's basically, the, because it's all fallen and ruined and, <laughs> and so on and so forth. But, um, but the fathers were great at extracting parts of the psalms even out of context um, that, were, that were useful. Um, so, but during, during, this, during the Trisagion, the, the choir sings it first, then um, the bishop, because, okay, um, while, <coughs> while the prayer is going on, the deacon comes to the bishop and says, Bless Master, the time of the thrice holy. Then he goes out onto the ambo, right? So, so now you've got the bishop standing here. Doors are open. Um, and so the deacon goes up, stands here, and the bishop, after the prayer is, is done and the choir is, is done singing the Tripartite in Kentuckian, um, the bishop says, For holy art thou, O our God, and unto thee do we send up glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, then stops. Um, then the, the deacon says, um, O Lord, save the pious and hearken unto us. Um, 
and then that's answered by the uh, uh, by the choir, and then the deacon finishes it off, and unto ages of ages, kind of with a grand sweeping gesture, as he goes into the uh, um, back into the altar, back up to venerate the high place, and then back to the side. Um, during the first, and then that's when the choir starts singing Holy God. The choir sings the first Holy God. As the deacon comes back from the high place, he's gone here, he grabs the dekiri, the two candles with uh, uh, the, the, uh, that are symbolic of uh, uh, the two natures of Christ, and he hands them to the bishop. And the bishop puts them on the gospel book. Remember, the gospel book is sitting in the middle of the altar. The bishop makes the sign of the cross with the decury on the um, on the gospel book, while the while the second time the clergy are singing "Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy and Lord, have mercy on us." Then a priest, second priest, gives the bishop a hand cross. The choir sings "Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy and Lord, have mercy on us." Then the bishop goes out onto the ambo. And, O oh Lord, Lord, look down from heaven. Um, here we do it three times in th three languages. Interspersed by, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Lord, have mercy on us. Then the bishop goes back in, hands off the, uh, uh, the hand cross, and... Um, goes to the high place, to the throne, and the clergy around. Um, he blesses first with the decury, which he still has in his hand, hands that off, and then with the tree curie, as the clergy continue to sing, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Lord, have mercy on us. Um, then he hands that off, and uh, stands on the high, in the, at the throne in the high place, uh, waiting for the for the next thing. So, so what it is, it's a continuation of the whole entrance, which is moved from here into the altar, and ultimately to the throne, where the bishop is facing that way, of course. Um, but from the throne, he's facing out, facing the people. Um, and um, presides there, facing the people, <coughs> because the next stage is the readings. When, um, when does he say, Blessed art thou on the throne of thy glory? Okay, that's what, when the bishop goes to the high place, um, he blesses the high place with the, with the decary, and says, Blessed art thou on the throne of the glory of thy kingdom. Okay. Who sits upon the cherubim, all is now and ever into ages of ages. Amen. In other words, I saw, the, I saw the Lord seated upon a throne, and His glory filled the holy place. Blessed art thou on the throne of the glory of thy kingdom. You see the, you, you see the connection. Now, remember in the second temple, after you know when. Uh, which was the creation of the Jews who came back from the exile, the holy place was empty. There was nothing in there. In the first temple, you had not only the Ark of the Covenant and the seven branch candlestick and, and this other stuff, but you had the throne of the king. Who was the sacrament of God in the midst of his people. Emmanuel, God with us. Blessed art thou on the throne of the glory of thy kingdom. Um, 
you know, it's... The, in the later, um, in the post, uh, in the Masoretic text and all of that, all that stuff has gotten obscured. And they, uh, and there's not, and, there, and they don't really talk about the throne of the king in the temple. But David was a priest and king. Solomon was both priest and king. And, um, and it was, uh, and was understood as the sacrament of, essentially as the sacrament of God, because he wore a, uh, a golden crown that said Yahweh on it. In other words, it was a, it's not just a decoration like, you know, we have crosses on everything that we can possibly imagine. <laughs> it was his name. The king became Yahweh when he became king. Was that commanded by God to do that? Or did they is it that, that's, upon themselves? That's the tradition. That that's the that's the ancient tradition as restored by the scholars. The anointing mean in Greek is Christos, right? Anointed one? Yeah. And so the king was the anointed of God. Yeah, almost see. So can you explain what you mean by sacrament? Because there's Okay. Um the king, um, when I say sacrament, especially in this, in this level, um, and especially in terms of, you know, this uh, ancient Jewish context, um, the king was understood to be God in the presence of his people, who was born when he was anointed um, in the in the in the holy of holies. It couldn't be overstepping? I don't think so. Well, God wasn't too enthusiastic about giving them a king, remember? <laughs> then why would he why would he allow them to consider that I mean people are flawed. I mean how could that be okay? Well right now we're just talking about what what's what's the history and not about what God wanted or not wanted. Okay. Okay. That's a that's a theological discussion. This is a historical discussion, but it's a historical discussion which is about this text. Where did this text come from, and where did this concept and where did this kind of? Because it's an incredibly visual, you know, and I mean that you can you can picture the the Lord sitting on the throne of glory in the kingdom, His glory filling the temple. Um, it's, uh, you know, and what is the glory? The glory is the uncreated divine energy. Um, so, radiant light. Um, and, and it talks about, and so it talks about, for example, Moses, you know, having come down from, um, from being on the, on the top of Mount Sinai in the cloud, he was, he was transfigured so that nobody could even look at him. He was so radiant with light that he had to, he had to veil himself because people could not stand to look at him. Um, it, there, there was such holiness. Um, so, uh, here again, you're talking about, you know, very deep in, in, into, into a kind of mystical vision. Um, and and truly, when we enter into um, in, into the, into the liturgy like this, we're ascending to the throne of God in His kingdom. You know, where the bishop is the image of Christ, the High Priest, the sacrament of Christ, the High Priest, uh, by the grace of God. Christ was not anointed, right? He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. You mean when he was baptized? Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of anointing. It's a higher anointing. You know, um, actually, at the, at the time of Jesus, um, that oil of anointing, which had uh, been used to anoint or ordain priests and, and prophets and kings, had disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
There was no there was no anointing oil. That's why it's no more priests and no more no. kings. Well, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's that's right. Um, and after and after the return of the exiles, instead of instead of prophets, they had a book. So there were you know there were no great prophets after the exile. Uh, there were there were minor prophets, but nothing. No one like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah or um, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Now Daniel is a different. Sorry, I don't I don't know that Daniel was an anointed prophet. So that's something to look up. Now. So, so the whole orientation, um, at least of the clergy, um, has has changed from, um, you know, from uh, being present before the altar to enthroned behind the altar, looking out. And so, what happens next is the are the readings. <clears throat> Actually, the first thing that happens um, after the after the choir finishes, the deacon says, "Let us attend," and um, and the bishop blesses, "Peace be unto all." <clears throat> now, um, th that's what Christ said to to his disciples when he appeared from the uh, from the dead um, in the in the upper room. Um, that was the greeting that he used: "Peace be unto all." Um, and then uh, let us attend. Uh, we'll add to thy spirit wisdom. Okay. Then we have the structure, the structure of the readings. <clears throat> and here again, you know, this is not just the readings are there, not just to get through a particular text, not just because, you know, they were set up this way so that everybody could kind of follow a common lectionary and we get through the through the New Testament and you know in a, in a whole year and all, all that kind of thing the readings are there because they manifest the presence of Christ and his apostles um, and so um, On. Epistle. Hallelujah. Sensing. What's that? Sensing. Yeah, I'm getting there. to what I've, I've done a lot of investigating and asked many, many people. And what I've heard back is that this sensing is the sensing of the gospel. Yeah. So it says here that it's the sensing of the, in, um, the holy table all right. around, the altar, right. the priest, and, uh, and it's the sensing of the gospel. However, in the Greek church, what is it? That's what they do in the Greek church. And I No, they don't. The Greek church they sense the gospel. Well, I've asked I've asked the Russian tradition and the Greek tradition and the Antiochian tradition. This is I've, Russian tradition. And I've checked and I'm looking at Russian tradition here. And nowhere does it say it sense you sense the people. Right. During the epistle. Right. And um, the, that, simp that simply become the Russian tradition. Now, originally, um, there's the Prokimenon, you know, which is psalm verses that are appropriate to the, um, to the feast or to the day of the week or to the, um, you know, the saint of the day, depending on, on which readings are being done. <clears throat> 
And in the Russian tradition, the, um, the sensing is done during the Pokemonon. And this usually comes, this really comes from, I think, uh, the priestly practice creeping over. Um, uh, because the, the, uh, when you just have one priest alone, um, he doesn't read the epistle, but he has to read the gospel, which means he has to have uh, the sensing done before he can read the prayer, um, the prayer of the gospel. Um, during the Alleluia verses. <clears throat> However, the original form is that um, there, there would be the Pokemon on the epistle, and during the Alleluia verses, um, the, gospel would, the gospel book itself would be sensed, and then they, get, then they hand off the censor. Instead, we, 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 start at the, we start during the Pokemonon, and so you've got all this time set, set aside. Um, so what do you do? You do a normal sensing, right? You sense around the altar and the, and the, uh, the proscomedia and the high place and the right side and the left side and the clergy. Then you go out and you do the iconostas and you do the people. Well, that's nice. <laughs> you know, it's called a, you know, it's called a short, short form sensing. Um, because the other form is the long form, and that's when you go at, when you go around the entire church, like at the beginning of the liturgy. But the original form is just during the Alleluia. The gospel is sensed nine times, and that's it. Well, one of the um, one of the deacons here, mm -hmm. um, the proto deacon here, senses it just that, and he doesn't sense the people. And the reason that I'm asking this mm -hmm. is because in the Greek tradition. When the epistle is read, you sit down, mm -hmm. and you stand for the gospel. Mm -hmm. But during the epistle, you sit down and pay mm -hmm. attention to the epistle. And so if somebody is sensing, then you got to get up for the sensing and then sit down again, and it becomes very cumbersome. Tell me about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what happens to the bishop and the clergy. The, the deacon comes in from sensing... Um, uh, the iconostas, and he senses the clergy, and, and so and so you've just sat down, you know, <laughs> finally taken a load off, <laughs> um, and and then you have to stand up again, and there may or may not be time to sit back down before you have to um, <laughs> go and get the the gospel book and give it to the deacon. Um, so so generally, the, the ones that I have spoken to and, and gotten this from, the proto deacons, do it the way that I. I'm saying they, they sense the gospel, they sense the altar, but they don't sense the people, because that's not at that time. They're sen that is the sensing for the gospel, not the people, at that time. Right, but the tradition is that's the that would be the older practice, but normal the normal practice is it's the short form sensing. What I what I usually find. Personally, in my in my little uh -huh. uh, investigation, is more than half the time they're doing they're not sensing the people. The rest of the time, people will come out and sense the people at that time also. But generally speaking, they don't. Mm -hmm. And that's here at St. John's also, mm -hmm. and in all the other churches. Here's the rubric. Okay. The reader chants, chants the Alleluia verses. After each, the choir repeats the Alleluia in the proper tone. The deacon goes to the holy table and senses around it crosswise, and then the table of preparation and the high place and all of the altar icons from right to left. Exiting through the holy doors, he senses both sides of the iconostas and goes back in, the priest and the servers, then the reader and the people, the faithful. Okay. Russian rubrics. Russian rubrics. Same Russian rubrics, and it says just the opposite. <laughs> From where is that? Two different this is from. Hang on a second, I'll get to the beginning. Oh, we'll see that. It doesn't say. This is um, Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, English only, with the priest and deacon's audible parts in bold, silent parts in gray, rubrics in italics. Who published it, though? I don't know. I said, well, let me go back to where I downloaded it. Vladika, uh, 
just so that there's no confusion, uh, when you say that the king um, was understood to be God amongst his people, I mean, that, that doesn't have to be taken extremely literally, like he's God, but that he, he was a rep the representative of God, correct? Like he, no, at that time it was taken very literally. Very literally, really. Oh. <coughs> right. Or as the manifestation of God. <coughs> in the in the Rokor book, the rubric is, while the Alleluia is being chanted, the deacon, taking the censer and incense, approaches the priest, taking a blessing from him, senses the holy table round about, the whole altar, and the priest. <coughs> this is from Sluzmik. Uh, Sluzmik. <coughs> okay. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> www.orthodox.net and S L Z E B N I C Chrysostom. So it's anyway. I'm telling you what the what the normal okay. practice that I I know. Okay. Is whether it's right or not is a different story, but there's the normal practice. I I asked one priest, and I was so enchanted by his answer. I I said, uh, what what is right? And he kind of said, well, now you have to understand. And I said, oh, so it's, it's like normal orthodoxy. He said, that's right, yes, enough you know, people will tell you you're wrong. <laughs> Actually, what's right is what the bishop says to do. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. That is the case, by the way. Is it, yes. is it yeah. so important? <coughs> no. no, but symbolically there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the original practice, the original form, is that it's entirely a focus on the gospel, where it's just the gospel book that's being sensed. Um, the later on, it's, you know, it's as much broader. I mean, it's, is it, is it, is it, was it wrong? No. It's just, it's just a different practice. It doesn't hurt to be blessed. It doesn't no. hurt to receive the blessing. No, exactly. Does it hurt to not receive it? <laughs> to not receive it? Well, I, if I were to sit there when he was sensing, I think that would be like not receiving the blessing. So I always stand up. It also depends if you're uh, allergic to the incense or not. <laughs> um, so anyway, you have this sensing. <coughs> the bishop is hanging out on the listening to the reading, God willing. Um, and... Uh, we're keeping on the epistle, um, the Alleluia, here again. Um, psalm verses, usually psalm verses, sometimes they're from other sources, um, that are interspersed with Alleluia, according to the, the feast, or according to the day, or according to the, to the saint being celebrated, and the gospel reading. Now, the prayer of the, of the gospel is... Uh, quite a, quite a, uh, also a very important prayer. Uh, Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee do we send up glory together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, thine all holy good and life creating spirit, now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. I would bet that this form of this prayer is not original in the liturgy. And the reason is, who is it addressed to? Christ. Christ. It's addressed to Christ. Who is the rest of the liturgy addressed to? Uh -huh. The Father. Oh. Yeah. So, and that's not that this is a bad prayer or anything else, you know. It's a fine prayer. Um, but here again, the liturgy has a history. And I would, and I would bet that this prayer, because the liturgy, uh, the prayer in the liturgy of St. James is, is totally different than this. Um, which is an older form. Um, no. Um, 
so you have this you have this prayer of the gospel, and then um, af after the deacon has finished the sensing, whenever that is, <laughs> um, he comes uh, he comes up and the uh, usually junior priest or it could be the senior priest uh, stand stands before the holy table, actually whichever priest the bishop sends. Um, and they bow together, and the deacon takes the gospel and goes to the center, uh, to the ambo where the bishop had been standing before. Now, uh, every, I think you've all seen the eagle rugs, right? Mm -hmm. those, all those rugs that get you know, the altar boys <laughs> flick in front of the bishops, and sometimes it lands right, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, so the eagle rug, which is a sign of a bishop, uh, the Greeks don't use them very much. That's because they have an eagle carpet. Uh, they have also. Oh, it's. I mean, it's good. Yeah, but they that it's one. Yeah. And not dozens of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, they also very often will have a uh, an eagle in the center of the ambo. Mm -hmm. Because the Greeks have a big ambo. For the Greeks, the ambo might be like this. In a Greek church, and the bishop's throne, instead of being here, will be here. So he doesn't stand in the center of the church, like no, like, no. So here instead of here. Um, this is later, because the bishop went and sat in the emperor's throne um, after the fall of Byzantium. Um, but the Russian Russian usage, like most Russian usages here, um, is more conservative and more ancient. Um, but the 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 proper place for the for the gospel to be read is from from the ambo, from where the bishop had been standing, um, because when the deacon reads the gospel, he always reads it facing the altar. Now, some. Sometimes the deacon will read the gospel in the royal doors. Um, that's, that's kind of okay if you have, if you have a good apse and, and a natural acoustic from the way the church is constructed. If you don't have that, it's incomprehensible. Um, and one of the biggest problems of, of how churches are built in this country um, is that they don't have decent acoustics. Because um, because you should be able to do the liturgy without electronic amplification. Um, now in Greece they have all sorts of electronic amplification, and they and sometimes they put the speakers on the streets, and you know, <laughs> you know, so people can stand around the church. Of course, God forbid you go into the church. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, you can kind of catch the liturgy here and there as you do whatever. Smoking. Smoking, drinking coffee, hanging out. Um, so, but, you know, this is, this is the reason, one of the reasons why Orthodox churches have an apse behind the altar is because it's this incredibly powerful natural amplifier that, um, uh, will disperse the sound throughout the church. Now, the Russian tradition, as it developed, um, which then got applied in many Greek churches, is that the iconostas, like here, is this huge wall. So you can't understand anything um, if you're standing behind the wall, um, because the sound is so dispersed that it's but um, so sometimes they read in the Russian church such a way that you'll never understand what they read. Well, it's mm -hmm. just like putting a loud voice and mm -hmm. blah blah blah. It's a shame. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's the altar table. There's the bishop's throne. We've got the bishop's. In, in the ancient Byzantine churches, the iconostas was like this. One row. There was, 
It was maybe like this. Um, and the icon may be, you know, full figure, or maybe half, but um, in the Russian churches, they kept adding layers. And so the entire acoustic arrangement got messed up. Um, because, it, relatively speaking, the reader would be out here someplace and projecting into that, you'd have, the, you'd have this entire area filled with sound. Or if he was standing here, projecting up into, in through the open doors, into the, into the rounded apse, it would just project throughout the entire church. You see, I mean, everything, everything is in, everything is involved. The architecture, the acoustic engineering, the, you know, the art. I mean, you know, it's all interrelated. That's why it's important to have, you know, um, this can be very, very beautiful, but it's not very practical. Um, then I've been in Greek churches. with a wall. Actually, with a solid wall, and the icons were just tacked onto it. And so all you have are these little doors, and sometimes it's that thick. And those are later Byzantine churches. Um, and in that case, then they have the stairs over to the left that they go up the stairs and they... Some do. Yeah. Not all of them. No, not. Yeah. But I've seen some like that that then have the stairs. Yeah. So, so when you have a when you have an altar like this, you need electronic amplification, because <laughs> um, nobody will hear or understand anything. Um, now, one of the, you know, of course, there's the whole issue of language, and. Uh, the reality is that two-thirds or more of the Orthodox world goes to the liturgy in a language they don't understand. Russians go to Slavonic, Russians, Ukraine, and Ukrainians, well, Russians go to Slavonic, Belarusians, I think, probably to Slavonic, Ukraine, but Ukrainians or go to Ukrainian, Serbs to Serbian, Bulgarians to Bulgarian, um, Greeks, and the... It's 4th century Greek. They don't understand it. Um, Romanian is modern. Um, in, in Finland, they have the liturgies in, in modern Finnish. In Arabic, it's in classical Arabic. So they don't understand it. Um, <laughs> it's a normal thing in the Orthodox world to go to liturgy in a language you don't understand. Um, but I don't think that's a very good thing. As St. Basil said, there's lots of bad old customs. Um, and although it's very beautiful and very poetic and Slavonic or classical Arabic or classical Greek, um, and it's hard to imagine the liturgy in uh, Demodiki, you know, which is uh, typical spoken Greek. It sounds like the newspaper. Um, and there are some English translations that sound like a newspaper, um, which is bad, because that's not what it's supposed to be. Um, In English, we use the and thou. Right, but that's a whole lot different than... Yes, I realize. But yeah. I mean, we do set it apart that way. Uh, yeah. yeah. But there are also other things. For example, in the liturgy, is always... Take the Book of Common Prayer, which is the kind of liturgical standard for 500 years of the English-speaking world. Um, it's, it's high poetry. You've got many levels of the language, and this goes for most languages. 
all literary languages, um, where you've got the very sophisticated, beautiful, poetic form, and then you have kind of the form of the business form. Um, and you don't have to be able to understand the high poetic form in order to do business. Um, actually, the language of the New Testament is the business form of Greek at the time of Christ um, and the apostles. Um, uh, kine, um, or koine, as they um, sometimes pronounce it, is basically uh, street Greek from the first century. Um, but what it did is it set a literary form. Um, but the later Greek uh, literature that was composed, especially the, the poetic hymnography, is very high, very sophisticated, and, um, and it takes somebody who's highly educated to understand it. Um, so one of the difficulties, for example, of translation, um, the canons, for example, that we use at Matins, um, you know, part of the service where we say glory to the Holy Resurrection, O Lord, and there's a, a hymn and glory to the Most Holy Theotokos, save us, that part of Matins. Some of those canons are so sophisticated, the Greek is so sophisticated, they can't be translated adequately. Um, the, the poetic form is so profound. Um, and some of them, the Slavonic translations, just don't work. And they're incomprehensible in Slavonic. <clears throat> this is a few of the feast day canons and things that the most, some of the most sophisticated stuff. Um, <clears throat> but your average, your average uh, uh, guy on the street would have no idea what's being said. Um, but the ethos of the church has never been to dumb it down. The ethos of the church has always been to raise people up through education to a, uh, to a higher level, um, a higher cultural level. Um, and uh, that, I think, is the basic concept of, of serving in a liturgy that nobody knows what you're talking about. It just, it's a mystery, that's why. You don't have to understand. Well, there, there's a mystery. <laughs> It's there's a mystery, and then there's mystification. <laughs> and that's not helpful. Do you think there could be a better English translation? It's more understandable in English, I can tell you. I don't understand someone here. Mm -hmm. I think I understand. It's, it's, it's not nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think we've, we've come pretty close. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I still prefer the OCA translation because it's more fluent. Mm. The real core translations drive me nuts because there's always a few extra syllables. <clears throat> and, the, and the word order is not English word order. Um, is it's the like, creed different in the OCA translation? Or is it exactly the same? Um, slightly. It's just slightly. For example, the Treparian for uh, Theophany. When, when thou, O Lord, was baptized in the Jordan, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. Rokor is, when thou was baptized in the Jordan, O Lord, um, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. <coughs> it's like, I don't know whether they didn't, you know, they were looking at one translation, but for the sake of copyright, they didn't just, <laughs> just copy it. Or, um, but some of them get really, really quite different. I can't, for the life of me, get the prayer for before communion down in the Rokor form. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> then you add the Antiochian translation on top of that, and it's like yeah. totally confusing. And, and the, just this wet, last weekend, the, the Greek was doing it in English, saying that prayer in English, and they just messed it up completely. I was just like, I cannot even follow this. Yeah. It's interesting. So... Uh, <clears throat> five more, five minutes. Uh, questions? We'll talk about the epistle and the gospel next week, and the and the lectionaries and all of this stuff. Although it's it's kind of interesting. Last Sunday um, uh, was the beginning of um, it was the the cycle for the Matins Gospel 
uh, started with number one, and the tone started with number one. So they both worked themselves through onto the same Sunday, uh, which is the beginning of the triodion. And so that's very, it's kind of interesting liturgically, you know. But you have to be a real liturgy geek to get into all that. Liturgy. Would you explain sensing again? Um, what, what about it? Well, I was under the impression that the sensing indicated the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And is that right. right? Right. Okay. So why would you sense before the Gospel? Well, that would be natural to do that. Well, why? I don't know why. Well, think, think about it. Isn't it what isn't the gospel the manifestation yes. of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Okay. And I mean, really, I mean that's that's what it is. The gospel manifests <clears throat> the presence of Christ, who teaches mm -hmm. by the by the grace of the Holy Spirit. I've always had a simplistic view of the of the. Um, sensing as you know from the evening prayers let my prayer arise as incense before you so when I see the incense I think of that as the manifestation of our prayers well it's that too there's there's always multiple levels of meaning mm -hmm. um, and some of them are directly connected with the text and some of them are purely allegorical um, like the altar boy going in front of the priest who carries the gospel is John the Baptist, you know. Well, that's cute. But, but it's an allegorical interpretation. But the word is Christ. But reading it is... The, so, when you have the presence of Christ, that means you also have the presence of the Holy Spirit, because that's how we have the presence of Christ? That's how, we, how we're able to hear the gospel. Okay. And comprehend the gospel. <clears throat> in the Holy okay. Spirit. Okay. You said that the uh, liturgy is the worship of the Father led by Christ. Mm -hmm. um, how are we to interpret the Trinity in that context? We have Christ acting as high priest, but he's also God. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a mystery, isn't he's it? He's the Son of God. Yeah. He's not the Father. He's the son. No, he's not the Father. And um, and so, what is the what is Christ's worship of the Father? His love. His love of the Father. But it's equal to the Father too. He's equal to the Father, sure. Is your son equal to you? No, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but, ser but seriously. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your relationship with your son? It's a relationship of love. Now, there's um, but there's ranking. Okay. Uh, because there's boys involved, there's rank. You know, it's not women who are you know, much more uh, un unconcerned about such things. <clears throat> but um, but it's a uh, you know, and 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 who is the and what is the holy? Who is the Holy Spirit? The 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 love of the Father. Pour, uh, poured out on the Son and returned by the Son to the Father. It's already personal, hypostatic. So you're saying the Holy Spirit is love? Well, the Holy Spirit is, is uh, it manifests the love of the Father to okay. the Son and the Son to the Father. Okay. And that's why God is person, why God is three persons, because they're, they're in, a, in a relationship of love. Person, personhood um, is uh, relative to love. So Christ's abiding in us through the Holy Spirit. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. So when we're motivated to do something, it's Christ and the Holy Spirit, or Christ by the Holy Spirit. In through by for mm -hmm. with. And what is love? Ah, that's a good question. It's it's ultimately, I think, the 
um, the grace of God. It's the divine energy. The divine so the so the father the father pours out his love for the son by giving him the Holy Spirit um, in filling him with divine energy which then returns to the Father. So there's this triple embrace. And into, in which, into which we're included. You know, it's not like God is up here and we're out here. You know, the typical American cultural ideas is that God is out there someplace and we're down here and God messes around in our world a little bit, but not much. And he does his thing and we do our thing, right? Isn't that kind of a typical idea if, if people believe in God? But, but the Orthodox understanding is that the world exists within what I like to say the womb of God. You know, the, this the completely surrounded by and filled by God um, between the three persons, within the three persons, by the three persons, for the three persons, you know. Um, God, is not out, God is not outside, he's inside, but he's not just inside, he's outside too. He's every, God is everywhere present, filling all things. And God is, and we are not outside of God. I had an anxious question. I have a hard time with being very literal, but I, I, I got the impression when we were studying that we pray, we're praying to the Father in the Son, in the by, Son the by the Holy Spirit. So why do we say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be in the name of the Son by the Holy Spirit to the Father? Would that be more accurate to say? There's a whole treatise written by St. Basil the Great called On the Holy Spirit, which is a treatise on prepositions. And it, you, the formula used to be, glory to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. That's the original formula for the Trinitarian. I can see saying glory to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit, but when you say, in the name of, mm -hmm. I thought it meant, I'm coming, because Jesus said to pray in my name, so mm -hmm. I thought we would say, it would make more sense to say, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, and then... Praying to the Father. Through, I mean, I just I don't understand. But I, I have a hard time saying uh, in, in the, the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit because I don't really get it. Well, um, well, that we don't really quite use that formula in the name of the Father. So. We don't. Well, it's usually glory to. Well, yeah, we do, of course. Um, we don't use the formula very often in the name of Jesus. Yeah, in but the, I don't understand because why would we say his name? Because he specifically said that we should come in his name. Right, but what does in his name mean? You see, and that's one of the things that, that we miss because it's a Hebraism. And it means in the person of. Okay. It, it's, it's, a, it's a much more um, concrete sense of not just um, I mean, it's not like a cause. But then, then we're saying we're coming in the person of in God. In the person of, in the person of God. But are we come? Are we can't. Can we really say we're coming in the person of the Father ourselves? Um, we're incorporated in the in into uh, with, into Christ's relationship with the Father. So yes, by so the talking, by, in the Son by the Holy Spirit. Well, we're talking to the Father also in the name of the Father. Um. You. Well, liturgical, liturgically. Liturgically. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It just means a lot to me when I say something that I really mean it. So right, right. I wonder if I have to say something if I don't totally grasp it yet, or if I, well, if I can say it differently. If no, I, you, what you do is you trust the church and its tradition, and eventually the, your, your understanding will, will come. Okay. Um, you do what the bishop says. Okay. <laughs> no, and, and that's trust the church and its tradition. Um, uh, well, when you say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like the beginning of a sermon, 
something like that. Um, that means that what follows should be from God. It's not not from the preacher. It should be from God, and that that's a whole other topic we'll get to next week with the epistle of the gospel. <clears throat> because the ser the sermon is actually, which actually belongs here, um, is a is a sacramental event. Um, it's a charismatic event of God speaking to His people um, through the epistle, through the gospel, and through the priest's interpretation. That's why not everybody can give a sermon. Just if I'm praying before dinner, if I'm praying for my son in his crib, I don't know if I can say I'm speaking for the Father. So I want him talking to the Father. So I didn't know if I was supposed to say that in my daily prayers, or if I could just say in the name of Jesus to, you know... Well, it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong. This is a session we've had. That's why I wanted to ask. Right, there's nothing wrong with saying in the name of Jesus. Okay. Um, but, uh, so, I, you can start your prayers in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It means that you're praying in and through and in the Trinity. Okay. In, a tr in a Trinitarian way to the Father. That's, that's what that means, essentially. Um, and that your prayers are not simply your prayers that... You're entering into Christ's prayer to the Father. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who prays in us with groans too deep for understanding. Yeah. Um, and uh, who, who conveys our prayers uh, uh, to the Father in Christ, uniting our prayers with Christ's prayer to the Father, which, which is what it means to pray in Christ or to be in Christ. Okay. So, um, so it's a... Uh, it's a real. Here again, it's uh, there's a a deep mystical uh, dimension to this, and uh, so does that make sense? Yeah. Good. It's very helpful. Anybody else? Okay. Well. Next week, same time. Okay, then the week, the week after next, um, I won't be here. <laughs> um, Sorry? Week after next, I don't think, I'm, I don't think I'll, I'm not sure whether I'll be here or not. So, week after next? Yeah, but next week I'll be here. Okay. That's, that's the 16th? Yeah. That's the President's Day. Yeah, I'll be in. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, San Antonio. I don't think I get back until I don't. I don't remember. I'll let you know next week. I don't remember what my airline schedule is. <clears throat> it is truly me to bless the Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim. More glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the Word. Through Theotokos we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, all is now from ages and ages. Amen. 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 Amen.